Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues This is Session 1, Part 1 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance where Jesus and Mary introduce and begin discussing the operation of God's principles and laws relating to forgiveness and repentance in response to listeners' questions. The session was recorded on 23rd of August 2017 from 11.20 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Hi everyone and welcome. Today I'm here with Jesus and we are going to be starting a series of discussions mm. that we've prepared relating to the personal application of God's laws of forgiveness. So to let you know a little bit about the subject of what we're going to be talking about, the discussion is about God's principles and laws relating to forgiveness, how these principles and laws affect those who want to forgive someone, and how they affect a person who has been forgiven by someone. So in summary, we're going to talk about how this applies personally to a person. So it's the personal application of these God's laws and principles. At other times and in other discussions, we've talked a lot about God's laws and principles sort of generally, and mm. we've given information about this. But this discussion or this series of discussions is going to be about personal application. We're also going to cover topics like the earth-based concepts that are very common about love and obligation that are not God's truth about the matter. Mm. <laughs> and we're going to talk also about how we would respond to people who judge and harm us after we've forgiven them. So I personally think that this is an amazing series that we're about to embark on in that it is very relevant for the world today, isn't it? I mean, we're surrounded by terrorism and yeah. all kinds of harm is being done to, to people all over the planet at the moment. And yeah. this... Yeah, so I should say hello to everyone. Hello, yeah. how are you going? <laughs> and yes, yeah, so I feel the topic is a really important topic because, because the... Uh, there is so much harm that happens to a person right from the time they've really conceived onwards that there is a lot of things to have to forgive if you really want to get on with your life and not be affected by the things that have harmed you. And, and if you look at, you know, what's happening in the world today, terrorism, wars, a lot, a lot of uh, interpersonal trauma, family-based issues, sexual issues, so forth, there's a lot of things that sort of build up over a person's life that they feel resentful about that and, you know, hurt about that and so forth. And these resentments build up and build up and build up more and more. If you don't know how to deal with them and you don't know how to address them, you can end up being a very angry person by the time you're 60, 70 or 80 years of mm -hmm. age. And often, unfortunately, in the world today, by a much sooner time, I mean, by the time you're a teenager, oftentimes yes. you end up quite angry. And, and this anger then gets perpetrated upon the world. So... So it is a very important subject in terms of if we're truly going to uh, solve all the problems in the world, then forgiveness is one of the key things we're going to have to engage. And it just reminds me of, you know, the whole Bible concept, if you like, of an eye for an eye, a tooth for truth. Yeah. You know, this whole concept that if somebody sheds a life, then their life should be shed. Mm -hmm. And as Gandhi said about eye for an eye, you know, obviously they will end up with the whole world blind. But if we take that one step further and look at it as from the perspective of a life for a life, which is the average person's uh, mentality and feelings about if some, someone that they love, is their life is taken by someone else. And mm -hmm. um, if you look at this whole aspect of life for a life, that can actually end up with the entire human race uh, gone, in fact. Yeah. You know, and, and end up with, you know, a nuclear holocaust, in fact. So, so it's a very serious issue that actually can solve a lot of the world's problems if it's properly engaged. And we're going to talk about that through this series, aren't we, that it is actually a solution because there's a lot of misconception mm -hmm. about forgiveness and that it's not powerful and that it doesn't solve problems. Mm. Yeah. And it certainly is a solution to most of man's problems today. While we sin, and, and I, I think the average person on the planet would have to agree that even though they might not agree with the word or terminology sin, mm -hmm. 
Uh, but they would agree with the fact that we create pain and hurt for others and ourselves. While we continue to do that, there is a strong need for us to learn about repent, uh, repentance and forgiveness, these two aspects, and particularly forgiveness when it comes to uh, what other people do towards us. And because, because if we don't, then we're just going to have a continual build-up of emotion associated with events that have harmed us or, or that we feel have harmed us. Yeah. And, and this can end up in personal disaster in our life, mm -hmm. but also can end up with national disasters such as wars and so forth all get caused by this kind of thinking mm -hmm. where in, historically whole world wars have been triggered not caused, but triggered mm. by just one's per, one person's death and the, the build-ups of resentment over many centuries before then, yeah. causing a whole nations to respond to that one person's death. Yeah. And, uh, and this is an indication that we do have a lot on, to learn. Uh, humans have a lot to learn about forgiveness. And, uh, and we need to understand uh, what's involved in the process of forgiveness if we truly want to help the earth and the world we live in, the hu humanity we, that we are engaged in, you know, sharing with on the planet. Yeah. Uh, if we're going to help everybody survive in a happy, in a happy environment, we all are firstly going to have to learn how to forgive. Mm. Mm. And we'll establish also that, that as you say, there's a benefit for humanity globally, mm -hmm. but there's also very personal benefits, aren't there? And yes. we'll talk a lot about that as well. Yes, yeah. and that's essential that we understand not only the uh, personal benefits, but also the global benefits of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay, those are so questions that Sandra has asked. So I haven't yet. Uh, let's give yeah. a little bit more pre preliminary <laughs> <little bit> background. <laughs> information. So basically we received an email from uh, someone in the United States called Sandra Sai, yeah. and she asked a number of questions about forgiveness from her personal perspective um, that indicated a lot of uh, misconceptions really she has about forgiveness, repentance, mm. uh, obligation, what it means to love another person. And that was kind of the spark for the preparation of this, of this uh, what will probably be quite a lengthy series that we do. Yes. And in the first one or two sessions, we probably won't even get to reading Sandra's letter yeah. because there's so much that we really want to establish, isn't there, before we go on to talk about Sandra's letter. Yes, it's, it's like a lot of groundwork we need to firstly cover before we can answer fully her questions that she's asked. And, the questions she's asked are questions that the average person on the planet asks about forgiveness yes. and, and also indicate the average emotional problems that most people on the planet have regarding actually forgiving somebody who's harmed them. Yeah. And, uh, and there's also, as we'll find in the discussion, uh, areas where we believe we need to forgive someone when really we need to be forgiven mm -hmm. you know, and we need to be repentant. Yeah. Uh, we, we have quite distorted viewpoints of what is hurt and yes. what is not hurt. Yes. And we need to also discuss those particular matters in this discussion. So it's going to be by, by, by necessity uh, a quite a long discussion, probably something that lasts eight to 16 hours in the long run. And so, <laughs> least, but it'll say. be broken into different sessions and different parts so people will be able to keep up with the discussion. Yes, mm. yes. We're not going to sit down for 16 hours now and discuss it. So we're going to No, we'll try for four time. hours today and yes. see how far we get. <laughs> yeah. But uh, usually, you know, probably the way we're looking, it's looking is that we'll probably have four, a minimum of four, four hour discussions about this particular issue to fully answer all of her questions. Yeah. 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 Mm. So let's get on to some groundwork mm -hmm. and let's talk in the next section about God's truth about forgiveness. Right. So the very first thing we need to know is how do we know God's truth about anything? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Very important question, isn't it? Like, how mm -hmm. do we know? Yeah. Mm. So there's, there's about five different ways that we've outlined in our outline yeah. that we can start to know truth or think that we know truth. Yes. So I'd like to ask you about each of those. Firstly, I'll just summarise them. Yes. We've got knowing the truth through hearsay. Yes. Knowing the truth through observation. Yeah. 
knowing truth through intellectual analysis and in this uh, example we're going to be speaking intellectual analysis of law specifically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, knowing truth through personal experience and experimentation mm. and then knowing truth through feeling mm -hmm. so I've got a number of questions about each of those mm -hmm. and I'm interested to hear what you have to say no <laughs> so let's get started no all right so so the, the whole question is, how do we know the truth about anything? Yeah. And then there's all these sub points that we need to cover, which, yes. which we'll get started on now. Yeah. yeah. So let's start with knowing truth through hearsay. Right. So what do we mean by knowing truth through hearsay? Well, you could put truth in quotation marks here, couldn't you? Because hearsay is when somebody else has told you that something is true. Now, unfortunately, on the planet today, most of us believe what other people t tell us, even though we have no evidence or proof mm -hmm. <laughs> that those particular things that are being told to us are actually true. Mm -hmm. And you see this a lot in gossip, you know, where, where you know, and, and the, you know, the, the large amount of gossip mags that are around are all, all uh, sort of going by this hearsay thing where there's a whole heap of accusations made, a whole heap of inflammatory comments, inflammatory comments made, um, but nobody really knows what the truth actually was. And what we've found personally is the media and other people who are involved in this kind of thing have no intention of really helping you find out what the truth was because it's not in their interest to. It's like it's more in their interest to just make it all inflammatory and so that so that your emotion gets tied into the whole examination of the material without there being any real knowledge of what the truth is or what truth isn't. So but unfortunately, um, hearsay, if we can call it that, which is which is just hearing things from other people that we have no evidence or proof actually happened or or or, or existed, mm -hmm. uh, but believing them is a common way that most people think they know truth on the planet. <laughs> and so there you've talked about, you know, a rumour mill or gossip and things like that, but it's even more um, basic than that, isn't it? Yeah. Like my mum taught me the truth about how to do the laundry, you know, and told me you, you don't... This is the best way. Yes, you wash certain things in cold, otherwise the colours will run or whatever it is. That's really sort of believing I know a truth through hearsay, isn't it? Yes, and, and most of the hearsay type truths, many of them do come from other types of truths, which is personal observations and other things getting handed down by generation and so forth. But, but a lot of them also come not keeping up with the times, where, where something might have applied 50 years ago, but it doesn't apply anymore because there's new technology or there's new fabric or there's new whatever it is <laughs> yeah. that has uh, now allowed for a different type of uh, you know, treatment of these kind of things to occur. And so uh, the, pro the problem with hearsay is that it often gets said once and repeated thousands of times without there even being a single piece of evidence that it's actually true or not. Mm. And, um, and this, as you point out, comes a lot from our families. Mm -hmm. You know, where dad points, you know, dad might not know the engine very well and he points to the carburetor and says, that's the injector, you know, and, and you know, you grow up thinking it's one thing when it's actually another, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and these kind of things commonly happen inside of families where family belief systems are perpetrated through hearsay. And, and also belief systems of a country are perpetrated in much the same manner, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, there's a belief, for example, in most countries, oh, we are the best country, well, you know, <laughs> what proof is there is that? And, <laughs> and should there be such a thing as the best country? And should there be countries at all? You know, those kind of things are never considered yes. because uh, no one's had an open enough mind to consider them because of the, the predisposition of hearsay, what, what that causes us to believe inside of ourselves at a young age that then gets perpetrated into our old age and also carries through unfortunately right the way through after we've passed and into the spirit world mm -hmm. so is it possible to know truth through hearsay like my dad could point at the carburetor and it is the carburetor and forevermore i just know that that's the carburetor correct yes it is possible it is possible. it is possible but it does require doesn't it the sincerity on part of the person who's saying the material, mm -hmm. that they've actually validated the truth mm -hmm. uh, of that material that they're perpetrating or, or, or repeating 
upon you know to others yeah and so yeah that, that, it, it is possible certainly mm -hmm. to know truth through hearsay but but it, it it depends a lot on the emotional condition of the person from whom you're receiving it yes or from where they the, the emotional condition of where they received it from and so forth so yeah. so you are depending a lot mm -hmm. on the sincerity the purity the ethics the morality of the people you're hearing it from yeah yeah so that probably leads me to my next question, which is, what are the drawbacks of knowing truths via hearsay? Yes, yeah, so obviously there's many drawbacks. There's some advantages, obviously, in that you don't have to uh, go and investigate it yourself. But unfortunately, unless you do, you don't really know <laughs> whether it's the truth or not. So, so that's, I don't know if you could say that's an advantage. And the drawbacks are that you don't really know if it's the truth or not without there being a lot of validity checking and uh, validation of the information you're receiving. And unfortunately, with the way information is rapidly dispersed nowadays through the internet and other technologies, it's very hard to validate whether something was actually true or not. Mm -hmm. And you can actually go to sites now like Wikipedia, which are thought to be true, mm -hmm. and find a lot of error on them because they have repeated the error of the media, for example, and mm -hmm. other sources. And so you can't even really be sure that those particular sites are telling you the truth on some subjects and particularly on subjects that relate to other people or other people's experiences and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then there's also the drawbacks related to history and her story, you know, like yeah. a person wants to tell a version of the story that seems to make them look pretty good and make the other person look pretty bad generally. Yes. And so, you know, because of these emotional injuries, you get uh, versions of history, which are not really history, but they're his story. And mm -hmm. they're not the real truth. They're not the actual story, the actual events that happened. They are just the perceptions and oftentimes distorted perceptions mm -hmm. of people who have written those particular stories, bearing in mind, of course, that most people who do write about history have what they would see to be as valid reasons for keeping their story about it and mm. perpetrating that story down the line. And, and frequently those reasons are to distort history in order to have a you know a different viewpoint of a culture or a nation nation or an individual and so there's a lot of disadvantages of this hearsay versions of <laughs> yeah. truth and would you say obviously just what you were mentioning about you know history being recorded by the conquerors and those yeah. kinds of things or even people promoting a certain lifestyle or promoting a certain thing and saying this is the truth Eventually, uh, inevitably, it seems, and I believe inevitably through the working of God's laws, the untruth within those things is exposed, isn't it? And is that why people yeah. become quite disillusioned? Because they've always relied on hearsay. Well, you say inevitably, but inevitably is true, but oftentimes it's tens of thousands of years or thousands of years after okay. the events. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, this has a very negative effect on the people who believed those particular things for that period of time. You know, until they actually discovered what the actual truth was, they believed a falsehood. And frequently, they make decisions and base their life uh, experiences and their life future decisions upon those falsehoods that they hear. So it does have very negative consequences when the truth, so-called truth, and it not being truth is repeated over and over and over and over again. And you see this particularly with religion, because mm -hmm. religions have such a long-term effect on the childhood of an individual. They then can also, you know, obviously, obviously have a huge effect on our adult choices and decisions. And so if a religious item or thought is incorrect, but is hearsay truth, mm -hmm. There is a, a lot of uh, motivation inside of the individual to carry that truth to their grave and even beyond. Mm -hmm. And so it can cause a lot of damage to the individual who does that. So initially, when you look at hearsay, it might seem quite innocent, but actually it is very, very dangerous uh, in the long run to most of our lives. And in fact, once many people uh, after most people pass, and they start seeing the actual truth, 
they often have huge amounts of emotion to release regarding the fact that they were taught untruth for such a long period of time mm -hmm. by the different sources that it came from. Mm. Yeah. But there is a, obviously a personal responsibility here too. We must recognise when we are involved in hearsay, yes. um, whether it's by perpetrating it or listening to it, mm -hmm. rather than actually listening to the actual truth. And this is where I see the majority of people on the planet today are really falling down because there is no internal recognition of the damaging effects of the potential, the potential damaging effects of hearsay and the potential damaging effects of firstly creating it mm -hmm. and then secondly perpetrating it and then thirdly listening to it and imbibing it and making choices upon it. Yeah. And these kind of things can affect our life very severely and it's very important that we see how severely. And, and once we see how severely, it's highly likely that we won't repeat hearsay until we've validated information mm. further. Yeah, and so it almost sounds like you're saying that knowing truth through hearsay is actually not knowing truth. Well, it, it's the potential to know truth. But do I really know it? But you won't know it inside of yourself Ooh. as an experience. It's just the potential. It's just a, a, a source of information yeah. which may be valid or may not be. Mm -hmm. And it really needs to be double checked um, before you could actually validate it as truth, as God's truth. And could you say that that's a potential benefit of hearsay if, if I hear it with full knowledge that I'm listening to something that is not established inside of me. It could be the possibility for investigation. Yes. Or, or, and that leads us to our further further ways of knowing truth. Exactly. It yeah. can help us in our guide for, you know, finding out the truth. Because the question began with how do we know the truth about anything? Mm -hmm. And this is one way of finding out some truth, mm -hmm. but um, not a way necessarily of believing it. It's a way of getting information, if you like, source of information yeah. that may be truthful or may not be, mm -hmm. depending upon the source yeah. and depending upon and, and sources today, often that are so called or, or felt to be truthful sources, often repeat hearsay yeah. where the actual hearsay is false. Yeah. And this is very much the case with the media. We have found one media uh, corporation might be very unethical and create a whole lot of you know, in our case, they've created just a whole lot of lies. And then what they do is they repeat that. And then another truthful, more truthful source of media sees the media doing that, assuming that they have been ethical and moral in the way they've collected that information. And then they repeat those lies. Mm -hmm. So you can't even guarantee that a truthful source normally is actually giving you the truth on the matter without yes. there being some evidence uh, you know, that can be provided through other methods other than the actual media or, or what's written in a paper or, or what's recorded on telly or whatever. And if I could expand beyond the media, also government institutions, they, they so-called government... Um, yeah, they're very good at this. <laughs> they're very good. They, they often dictate how a whole country should be educated about a certain topic, mm -hmm. health, lifestyle, mm -hmm. diet... Uh, relationships even, mm -hmm. they mandate government, um, this policy. is our established policy and mm. what must be taught in our institutions. But very often what they've established is not based on solid science or... And also so oftentimes if it's historical, not based on actual fact of what yes. actually occurred, yes. unfortunately. And on, on top of that, you know, you've got things like what we eat and what we wear and all of these different things. We're told, you know, oftentimes what we should eat and what we should not eat and so forth by governments mm -hmm. without there being any valid uh, information provided. Often in the face of contrary information. Correct. It's, it's become outdated because there's been more fact established or even in the establishing of the dietary guideline, yep. there's a lot of uh, financial... A, um, exactly. It's a purposeful uh, lie yes. in order to uh, promote commerce in a certain industry, yes. for example. Yes. And you see that a lot with meat eating, for example. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. you know, we, we see all this, the, the evidence of hearsay type of truth everywhere in our lives and you can see why it is such a dangerous thing to engage and yet by you can see by the um the, the number of gossip mags around the place that people love it mm. people just love it they they eat it all up you know 
And a lot of times they eat it all up for other emotional reasons. They, they don't even half the time believe what they're reading. They just go, oh, wouldn't it be funny if that was true type of feeling? And, uh, you know, you know, obviously there's not much moral or ethics involved in that. So. No, no. All right. So to summarise, <laughs> knowing the truth by hearsay is by that we mean no, the possibility to know a truth by just hearing it from another source. And what you're saying is that while there is some potential that you might actually hear what is true, uh, it's you not necessarily know it. known or it's not established within you. And it can't be. And it can't be. It can't be because you have to validate it before it could be established. Yeah. And that's the major drawback with trying to learn truth through hearsay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you need to validate everything. And how do you validate everything? Go and get another piece of hearsay and go, well, now that I've got 10 pieces of hearsay, now it's the truth. <laughs> you know, obviously not, because they could all just be repeating yeah. from the same source, the same information. Yeah, or from different sources that it, like the internet is kind of crazy making like that. You can find anything to meet your a million different points of view. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right. So obviously God's truth, which is what we're talking about here is not going to be easily established through hearsay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's hearsay from a religious icon or a, you know, an economic icon or a government or, or a parent, you know, yeah. or, or, you know, someone who you trust or don't trust, whether, whatever source it's from, it, it always will need to be validated. Mm. All right. So let's move on. Our next topic or our next series of questions on how to establish God's truth about anything relates to knowing truth through observation. Mm. So what do we mean by knowing truth via observation? Well, this is like examining, if you like, the principles of cause and effect. You, you see something happening, like the, the tree blowing in the wind and mm -hmm. it's bending over. You can't see the wind. You, can, you feel it hitting your face. But through this observation of the effect, you can then uh, anticipate not necessarily accurately, but oftentimes quite accurately, the source or the cause mm -hmm. of that particular effect. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to physical things, these are quite easy to determine. So for example, the wind blowing in your face is quite easy to, turn, to determine. Uh, you know, the fact that it's actually happening and, and even though you can't see it, the wind itself, you know, the atmosphere itself can't be seen by your human eyes, you can see the effects of the atmosphere and it, the differentials in pressure on the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a way of measuring the results, if you like, of the fact through observation that there must be wind and mm -hmm. it is a force of some kind and it's created by something. And, and we can take these kind of observations into things that we can't see even but that we observe the effects of. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the beauty of uh, examining through observation is that you get to see things happening and you get to go, okay, now that I know, you know, that's the effect, now I can try to find what the cause of that effect is. And there's a good chance, not always the case, but there's a good chance that you might find one of the possible causes through that analysis. Mm -hmm. And a lot of scientific discovery has started in that way, hasn't it? Certainly. By observing something and saying, yeah. oh, why does that happen? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you could say flight has come from observing the birds being able to fly, mm -hmm. right? So you can, if something can fly, you can then imitate or find out the reasons why it flies and then imitate that through some kind of device, mm -hmm. uh, which is what we've done. So, you know, there's been many things historically, radio waves, uh, you know, uh, which allow the transmission of information over, over the air and even through space. Uh, ele electromagnet electromagnetism, magnetism itself and other forces which are all invisible mm -hmm. are actually able to be seen by their effects and therefore observed. And so we can even see things, you know, so the whole idea seeing is believing is not true mm -hmm. because any person who says that is quite actually uh, in, in my mind quite silly because you know there are many things that we now trust our very lives in and we don't see them mm -hmm. so so believing is more about seeing the observation of the effect yeah and then saying and if the if the effect is predictable of a certain predictable cause now we have some kind of relationship between cause and effect and now we can base even our lives mm -hmm. on those relationships. 
So, so this is a much more reliable source of truth, mm -hmm. a much more reliable thing to base our lives on. And in fact, the majority of us base our lives on it every single moment of our day without even giving it much consideration at all. Yeah. 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 Because of it. It's so reliable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, it's got some good benefits. Yes. What are the potential drawbacks of relying on knowing truth through observation? Well, yeah, the, there are drawbacks. And the, one of the, some of the main drawbacks is we can make presumptions that are not true, particularly of the things we can't see the cause of. So in other words, we see the effect of it, but we can't see its cause. So for exa some examples of that could be what happens to the human body with disease. We, we see the disease eating away the human body. We can see the cells in the case of cancer eating the other cells. We can see that there is a, a problem going on in terms of the body not being able to correct it. And we, but we don't understand why at the soul level that occurs. We can see that it occurs physically and we start to understand through, through observation. Yeah. We start to understand the cause and effect physically, but we still don't understand the things that are behind that cause, you know, causes that we have not assumed mm -hmm. can't be measured. In other words, causes that we don't know anything about can't be measured. So you mean causes that we haven't considered? as yes. a potential can't yes. be measured. And the human race is great at ignoring many considerable causes, yeah. very large considerable causes, yeah. because we, we like to ignore certain things that relate to our emotional state and our moral state and our ethical state and our state of love and our consideration of our worth as individuals and so forth. We like to ignore all of those things. And we don't see the relationship there between the, those being the cause and the effects being things like disease. Mm -hmm. And so while cause and effect is a great thing to examine and, and certainly something that is valid in terms of discovering truth, it's not good for certain things and in particular for the things where we have no imaginary concept of what may be the underlying invisible cause. Mm. And, and that's where it's difficult. It's also the case, isn't it, that people uh, willfully want to stay in that state often, isn't it? Yes. Sort of, uh, we mentioned earlier terrorism and people wish to blame religion rather than looking at all of the socio-political factors that are imposed upon a certain religious group or a certain group of people over mm. a long period of time, along with the emotional belief systems within the religion and how those things come together to create an end problem like terrorism. Yes. And so it's sort of we're just always seem to be very invested in just looking at effects in a very – the cause is only one step up the chain, if you like. It's another effect almost. Yeah, well, it usually is another yeah. effect. Like why do religions get created? Because families have in them certain emotional injuries that allow for those religions to get created. If the families didn't have the emotional injuries in them, the religion would never be able to be created and anybody ever listened to it. Mm -hmm. So so unfortunately, you can see that if you trace things back further and further and further, there are primary causes. And then you could say there are, se there are effects that we think are causes. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, today on the planet, you know, we frequently see people blaming things as causes when actually they are just a, an effect of another more deeper primary cause which we are unwilling to examine mm -hmm. uh, in most cases. And so therefore, we're not very logical at times when it comes to cause and effect, even with things that we can see, mm -hmm. because we, we frequently have this sort of concept or idea that we can skip over what we want to skip over and still find some truth. And that's yeah. not the way it is with God's truth. So, you know, these are the problems associated with uh, drawbacks, if you like, associated with observation. You can observe the truth, but but finding its cause mm -hmm. is is a much more difficult problem than just tracing the cause back one step. So it sounds like you're saying when it comes to knowing truth through observation, we can start to understand certain relationships and establish them as truth, mm. but we can be limited when it comes to knowledge of the full truth about anything. Yes, and maybe if I give an example of that, if we, we go back to the cancer example, mm -hmm. we know that cancer exists. Yes. We, we can measure it in the body. There's, there's chemical and uh, 
and and pro other processes where we can actually shine the light on what's actually occurring. We can use technology, in fact, to see it actually happening. Yeah. So we know that cancer exists. We know that it's a disease and that it is, it is a true, it does truly exist. And we know the disease process that occurs. Exactly. We yeah. know the truth about the process to a degree. In the physical body. Only I mean. in the physical. Yeah. We know the truth. But if we knew the complete truth in the physical, you might even be able to cure it. And that's why people are looking at cures, because mm -hmm. they're trying to examine more and more and more the truth. What triggers it? What creates it? What makes some people get cancer and other people not? Even though everyone seems to have cancerous cells at a different time, what causes some people to get it to such a point that's where fine. it causes their death? Yeah. You know, these are issues and problems that the medical industry is working on right mm -hmm. now. And all of that is just the physical side of things. Mm -hmm. Now... That's not the cause, right? When you understand the soul and the workings of the soul and the effects on the spirit body of the soul and then the effects of the spirit body and the physical body of the soul, now you start tracing it back to its real cause, right? Which, which most people will not believe even if you tell them, mm -hmm. right? Because they're only interested in finding a physical cure. They don't want to know that actually the cancer is caused from an unloving condition that exists within their own being within their own self with it within their soul they don't want to know that because to know that would mean that there's a deficiency in themselves not in god mm. they would rather in fact blame god and say uh, you know who knows what god's done you know why has god done this way you know for those who are religious for those who are not religious they just blame it on you know whatever is happening physically but they would rather do that than actually find the actual cause mm -hmm. and address the actual cause because addressing the actual cause sometimes when it's emotional, is quite difficult to address, more difficult than popping a pill. So you would rather get the pill and mm -hmm. pop it than we would address the actual emotional cause. And this is why we have a preference to not finding the full cause. And so observation has helped us see that there is an effect, mm -hmm. but it hasn't told us the full truth. Yeah. That there is a cause for this effect and where this cause exists, it doesn't tell us the full truth about that either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. So observation is slightly more reliable than hearsay. Yes. However, there's other methods. Let's <laughs> move on. Well, you know, if we just use observation, it can be a very time consuming, difficult process, actually. And this is why scientists do take many, many years and sometimes hundreds of years yes. to solve medical issues because going by observation and trying to find, trace it all back to its physical physicality often results in a situation where you don't understand why it's still co being caused because the cause is not physical mm -hmm. in the nature or in the way that the medical profession believes it should be. Yeah. It, it, has a, as a, it has a real physical cause that's related to other parts of the human that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets very convoluted now and very mm -hmm. difficult to understand. So, yeah, so it, it's a, it's a, it is reliable to see, you can see the truth of the observation, but not necessarily see the truth of its cause. Yes. And remembering we're talking about how to know God's truth about anything. So we mm. can learn some of God's truth. Yep. Through observation. Through observation. Yes. Okay. Yeah, in fact, many of God's truths, a lot of God's truths, all the physical laws in the universe are all physically observable, of which there's millions of them, and they are all God's truth. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can observe millions of laws and their effects, but we don't necessarily understand fully their causes. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's talk about how to know God's truth via an intellectual analysis of law. Mm. So what do, you, what do we mean by it's of intellectual analysis of law? That's quite a... Um, Yes, well, uh, perhaps we could look at it in a family situation where parents decide that they're going to bring up a family. So they have a couple of children. And they decide they're going to make specific rules or laws by which the family will live. Now, if we intellectually analyse these rules or laws, we can, we can start to assume a lot of things or start to postulate a lot of things about the condition or the the ideals and the character and the nature of the people involved mm -hmm. so for example if a parent makes a law you can't go out and play on the street 
you know, that's a big rule that a lot of parents would make, you know, particularly in the Western world. In the third world, not made at all, hardly. That's the only <laughs> place to play. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but, but in the Western world, you know, frequently it's one of the laws or rules that are made by the family. We can start to uh, make assumptions about, well, obviously they care for their children's life. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't be worried about their children, you know, having an accident. Mm-hmm. But um, how much of this care is driven by their own fear and not, uh, uh, or not? And how much of this care of the children's life is, is actually helping educate the child? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's hard to determine that. But there are certain things that it does help us determine. They obviously care for the child. In, so they want, the child's, way, they want the child's life to continue. Yeah. So that's a very good thing. And, you know, they obviously have some reasons why they made the law. But we don't necessarily know what those reasons are, of course. Mm -hmm. Some of them might be what we would classify as moral and good Mm -hmm. or ethical. And some of those reasons might not be very good at all. You know, it might be a lot to do with control or manipulation and other kinds of things like that. So uh, but we we can't really know that. All we can know or do is intellectually analyse and postulate possible reasons why a family has created the law they've created. Mm -hmm. Now, the same kind of uh, analysis, we could say, applies to God's laws. Mm-hmm. So we could, we could say, OK, God created the law of gravity. Like, let's analyse what gravity does. Obviously, it protects us to a degree. It helps us stay on the planet. It means that all of our food stays on the planet and all of the air we breathe stays on the planet and so forth and so forth. All of these things help us to survive. So obviously, whoever created this law must have wanted us to survive for as long as possible. Otherwise, uh, why not just give birth and fly out into space and you have an existence of a few seconds and that's the end? You know, obviously, this person obviously wanted our life to be sustainable for long periods of time in the physical. Otherwise, the law of gravity would never have been created, right? So, So we can start to postulate possible Mm-hmm. Uh, concepts about the personality and nature and character of the individual who potentially created these laws, mm-hmm. assuming that there is such an individual existing, of course. Yes, that's the basic assumption that we yes. make there. Yes. Um, and we talk about how to establish if God exists in another whole discussion. Of course, yes. and there are many methods of establishing God's existence, and that is one of them, actually, the existence of intelligent laws mm-hmm. that support our life is, is actually one part of the evidence supporting God's existence. But, uh, you know, of course, there are many others. But, but even assuming all of that is not true, we could say, well, the fact that the law exists and the fact that it's working in our benefit is interesting in itself, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You would think if it was just all come about by chance that some of the laws will work in our benefit, some won't. But the reality is all laws seem to work in our benefit. Um, so particularly when it comes to the law of gravity, it seems to work in our benefit completely. So isn't this fantastic? Isn't that wonderful? How did that come about? You know, that helps us to start thinking about those kind of subjects too. Mm. So... Knowing truth through knowing God's truth through intellectual analysis of God's laws seems like it's got some benefits. Yes. What would be the drawbacks of that method of trying to establish God's truth? The drawbacks are related a lot to our personal emotional condition. In other words, we often feel that because we feel a certain way, it means somebody else feels that way. So, so to give an example, one of God's laws when it's broken, creates cancer. Yeah. Many times because of our personal emotional injuries, we believe we're getting punished by God by having cancer. Mm. Or we believe that God's taking us or putting us through some tribulation or putting us through some nightmare event for some future benefit that we can't see. We come up with all of these concepts and ideas, all of which, by the way, are false, all the ones I've mentioned anyway. But, but, we come up with those concepts and ideas because of our emotional belief systems. So frequently what we do is we analyse God's laws and then what we do is we distort the character of the individual based on our own personal character distortions. Mm. So obviously that's not very helpful in finding out the truth. No, and to me it seems like a very big drawback in that... uh there's a lot of ways I can go wrong through the analysis of just law alone mm-hmm. to help me learn God's truth and who is God. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really interesting how this analysis can be distorted so much by our emotional condition. And, and when you examine um, the, the relationship between our emotional condition and what we believe based on certain events, sometimes a logic, if you look at it logically, you go, how did you arrive at that conclusion given that circumstance? Because mm -hmm. there's 2,500 other conclusions you could have arrived at <laughs> yeah. that are all just as valid as the one that you arrived at. Why did you arrive at the one you arrived at? And frequently it's because of the underlying emotional distortions that already exist within us mm -hmm. caused by our parental upbringing and so forth that cause these particular distortions and therefore cause a distortion in our ability to be logical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on to hopefully some more reliable ways of learning <laughs> God's truth. <Yep. laughs> so let's talk about knowing truth, knowing God's truth through personal experience and experimentation. Mm -hmm. So what do we mean by knowing truth through personal experience and experimentation? Well, this is very similar to knowing truth through observation in a way. In the, in the, with observation, we're looking at things, cause and effect. But with observation, frequently, it's not what's happening to me. In fact, mm -hmm. quite often, we're not as logical in observation when it's happening to me mm -hmm. as we are when it's happening to somebody else. <laughs> we obviously, when it's happening to somebody else, we often can see, oh, well, there's the cause, there's the effect, there's the cause, there's the effect. But when it's happening to me, because I'm embroiled, in the situation emotionally and as we've already discussed there are distortions to our logic because of our emotional condition we often um, when it comes to uh, having that personal experience it's a very different experience than it is observing it externally mm. but it does have specific uh, teaching ability to help us uh, gather truth maybe if i can give you some examples if you look at a child uh, just growing up, just, just standing up, just starting to stand up. Now, as most parents know, um, while the child's crawling, yeah, it's pretty easy to child-proof your home <laughs> to a degree. But when the child starts walking, it's much more difficult to child-proof your home. And so now you have to start educating the child about things that are dangerous to it. And some of those things that are dangerous to it are things like hot, you know, things that are hot, like the stove, cooking, or a heater, you know, that's yep. in, the, in the main living room where everybody gathers around, or a fire. You know, these kind of things are very hot. Now, you can tell the child, and you can educate the child, hot, hot, you know, Bernie, don't touch, and all those kind of things. You can say all of those kind of things, but it's highly unlikely the child is going to <laughs> actually believe you. Take until, your hearsay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take your hearsay or even through observation of you getting burnt, yeah. until they personally have the experience of getting burnt. Mm. Once they touch the stove or touch the fire and they feel the burn and they feel the pain, they then realise, wow, you know, that hurt. There's obviously a reason for it hurting and the reason is related to what I just did. So I'm going to now attempt to avoid those kind of situations where I might be personally exposed, my skin might be personally exposed to that kind of fire or heat. Now, interestingly, these things can help us a lot to understand the motivation of whoever created us. Mm. Because, because obviously, what in this process, the pain, the beauty of the pain, in fact, there, there is a, a very essential part that the pain actually plays, this instant pain. And that is it tells you the limitation of your created body. If, if we did not have the pain associated with that, we would put our hand in the fire and our hand could literally burn off. Mm -hmm. And we could lose the complete ex existence of our hand through that process if there was no pain associated with the hand being put in the fire. Yeah. And you could see straight away that that would mean that we'd now lose our hand, potentially lose the ability to use it. Yeah. And obviously that's not whoever created us is like intention. So what they've done is created a pain mechanism so that we know the limitations mm -hmm. of our creation. Mm -hmm. And that is a loving act to actually understand the limitations of our creation. And the child who, who, who at this stage can't even be educated intellectually in most cases 
is able to understand these basic forms of communication of information, of truth, mm -hmm. and, and can respond to them, mm -hmm. and therefore survive, and therefore live a long life. Mm. And so we see this personal process of the experience has a very a strong effect on us and our ability to make decisions based on what is true and what is not. Of course, unfortunately, we often don't differentiate between our experience with people mm -hmm. and our experience with God's other creations. And this is where we often become very distorted in our emotional analysis of the effects. Right? Could you give an example of that? Well, an example of that might be that uh, there's a difference between um, somebody purposefully lighting a fire to burn me and me being accidentally burned by a law that says when my f fingers get too hot, there's going to be pain. Mm -hmm. right? There is a complete difference in intention there. And we might then start thinking the fire itself has an intention. Yes. When the actual the fire is just a law involved in the, in the creation of fire, it has no intention of its own. There is just a law that says I'm going to burn. If I've got matter and material and oxygen and fuel to burn, I will burn. And if there's a spark or a flame, I'm going to burn. That's yeah. all the fire does. There's no other emotional intent in it. But unfortunately, what we often do with many of God's laws is we start assuming there's emotional intent that's harmful. Mm. So in other words, when we get cancer, we assume that God's intent is harmful in creating it mm. when we don't understand its real cause. And so we start, we still don't, we're still, we're still struggling, if you like, with the joint, joining of cause, the actual cause, with the effect. So that's a certain drawback yes. of knowledge of truth through personal experience. Yeah. It's interesting that when you were talking about the example of the child burning their hand, for example, mm -hmm. and then you went on to talk about how we can sort of extrapolate things about God and God's nature and God's truth um, through, through observing that, and analysing that. And they're things that we've talked about earlier in the discussion, aren't they? The, they are. the knowledge of truth through observation and then through intellectual analysis of law. So really you've linked the, the idea of knowing truth through personal experience and experimentation. If we have an, it's basically like you're saying, if we have an experience, a personal experience, and then if we add to it the observation that that happens for everyone, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and then we analyse what that must mean. Oh, this certain thing happens for everyone and what does that say about our physical body and also so the truth about God's truth about our body, God's truth about uh, law, uh, God's truth about how we function and God, the truth about God's nature. So you're really marrying three different ways and it seems to me that that's it's almost another category on its own, isn't it, where we start to synthesise all of the different ways of knowing truth. You could say it is, but it's really just us using all the different methods in concert, isn't mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. together um, yeah. to, to extrapolate what the truth may be. All of them have different flaws yes. or drawbacks, yes. but by merging them together, we start to get a picture that therefore we can make more of our serious life choices and decisions about. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good thing. So, so when it comes to determining God's truth about any matter, we can see that frequently what we're doing is synthesizing or, or using many methods in concert with each other to determine the truth. And in fact, we have to do that if we don't know the last few ways of doing it, yes. of finding laws. We have to use these other methods in concert with each other because it's the only way to determine uh, enough of the truth that we are able to survive. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, just rounding up the, know the, the ability to know God's truth through personal experience and experimentation, it seems like that's a very quick and powerful, uh, when we have an experience that can be quite a bit more impactful when you talked about the experience of the child burning their hand. It, you mentioned it seems to have more impact 
Well, then... I feel if we if we differentiate between experience and experimentation, Good. because yeah. experience does usually have a very rapid and powerful impact upon us, but we don't always know its cause. Uh, that's our that's the drawback. So we don't actually know what's actually happened. Really, we're just having a powerful experience. Yeah. And unless there's some analysis or repeatability of what we've done, it's not necessarily reliable. Is that what you're saying? Not necessarily. Yeah. Because bear in mind that many of the experiences we have may have invisible causes, mm -hmm. have things that we can't see causing mm -hmm. them, and and under those circumstances, it's quite difficult to see the relationship between the cause and the effect. When it comes to experimentation, it's a much slower process generally, because what we have, what we normally do with experimentation is we create a safe environment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not like the child is going straight up and touching, you know, the hot stove. Yeah. We create a safe environment. And, and then what we have to do is postulate ideas or concepts through our imagination mm -hmm. or through what we observe mm -hmm. from other things, and then come up with potential solutions to those particular problems through experimentation. Now that could take many thousands of years on any single subject mm. to fully determine. So, so while the personal experience side is quite rapid in many cases, and but doesn't always, we don't always know its result, the experimentation side is frequently very slow mm -hmm. and takes many years, hundreds of years or thousands of years in order to find the answers. And would you say that being personally involved in an experiment has more drawbacks or benefits than me observing an experiment? Well, obviously, if you're personally involved in the experiment, there's a higher potential for pain than if you're observing somebody else involved in the experiment. Yes. So what is the implications of that? <laughs> well, the implications of that is that most people uh, want to experiment on things that have that usually don't involve themselves <laughs> in some way because they're afraid of getting hurt. Mm -hmm. and, and the implications of that are that it's much slower mm -hmm. to discover what the truth is, obviously. And, uh, and of course, uh, fortunately, nowadays, we have laws even that have been created to limit the risk of experimentation mm. because you could potentially harm the entire hum of human society with some experiments that you yeah. engage in if there weren't some kind of rules or laws that governed how much you experiment with things and what mm. you know what you're willing to do with these experiments and we see that particularly in the case of disease yeah. where humans have created diseases specifically for purpose of war or chemical processes for the purpose of war and so forth and if there weren't severe limitations placed on these particular things, the whole of the human race could be in jeopardy. Mm. So you, know, you can see that the problem with experimentation, you can still find truth with it, yeah. but uh, unless you're very ethical and very moral, mm. you also have the potential to cause a lot of damage to mm. other people as well. And would you also say that, say I engage in a personal experiment and we there's, I can see a couple of different things that could be potential benefits and drawbacks. One potential drawback is that unless I'm very honest about what are the actual outcomes of the experiment, then my experience could, I could be very subjective about it and, and allow my emotional condition to dictate how I analyse the results of the experiment. Of course, that's always, a, always going to be a problem. A problem, yeah. yeah. However, I can see the benefit is that if I am very honest, uh, I get very real results quickly and I can. So, again, we're talking about knowledge of God's truth in yeah. this discussion. Like, And again, we can see that ethics and morality of the individual and in being involved in the analysis yeah. is a key part to discovering it. Yes. And we can see you know, how that plays out, you know, yes. if. if if we are not ethical or moral in the way that we engage in the experiments or engage in our personal experience, we could cause very, very severe problems and still not understand the underlying cause. For, and God's truth about any matter. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so, so you can see now discovering truth isn't just a matter of presentation of facts now, is it? it mm -hmm. It's now when we analyze all of these things we've put together so far, it's not just a presentation of facts. 
It's, it's not just finding Divine Truth YouTube channel. Oh, no, I found God's truth. Now I'm in fact because 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 it has to be there has to be some ethics and morals involved in the facts, mm -hmm. and, and without them, truth is still going to elude us if we're not careful. You mean ethics and morality involved in our analysis of things? Not only our analysis, but let's say, and we engage in an experiment. In the experiment itself, it needs to be ethical and moral. You know, if we're observing things, that needs to be ethical and moral too. You know, like like it's not very nice of us, ethically or morally, to go and observe a war without any desire to uh, stop the war. You mm. know, in some way. So, but why why does the lack of ethics and morality in observation? prevent me from knowing truth. Just knowing truth, remember, we're talking about. We obviously have emotional reasons why we want to observe something that we have no desire to change. Yes. So, so this is what I'm stating, is we obviously have some ethic, ethical or moral problem that causes us to be fascinated by a certain issue, mm -hmm. but that we have no desire to change it. And this is things like, you see this a lot with natural disasters where people are so attracted to observing them over and over and over again, but have no desire to understand their causes or no desire to mitigate the effects of them. Mm. So you're saying that the inherent uh, issue with ethics and morality is going to colour what I perceive to be truth. Yes. If so I can't, unless ethics and morality is within me, which mm -hmm. is almost another uh, factor than you're introducing that we need in establishing God's truth. Of course. Um, then unless that's present, we can't reliably know God's truth about anything. No, because we are going to make presumptions based on our immoral and unethical position. Mm. And that's basically comes through in each of the points that we've mentioned, isn't it? The idea of knowing God's truth through hearsay. Yeah, so if we, if we look at hearsay, we yeah. go back to hearsay, for example, we can see that if we're unethical or immoral about it, we can perpetrate a whole lot of lies. And also think that uh, it's perfectly fine to think that I know truth when I'm learning it from someone who's clearly unethical or, unethical or unloving. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And if we look at the second point that we discussed, knowing truth through observation, and I think we touched on this a little bit, uh, if we're not ethical and moral in the way that um, in terms of being honest with ourselves about what it is we're observing, we'll and be tempted to believe something is true when it is not. Not only that, and also being honest about the fact we don't know all of the potential causes. Mm. There, there might be a whole slew of potential causes that are invisible to us mm -hmm. that have never crossed our mind mm -hmm. that we may need to find. And so you're saying that part of ethics and morality is being humble to knowing I don't know everything about this. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If we were truly ethical or moral, we would admit that. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, particularly when it comes to science today, it becomes very arrogant in the physical. And so it doesn't admit that. Yeah. And, and that's where there's a huge problem with regard to the discovery of truth through observation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Our third one was knowing truth through intellectual analysis of law. You can see exactly the same thing is going to apply. If, I don't, if I'm not morally or ethically in analysing such, such, such a thing, I could make presumptions about why a person created a law that have nothing to do with reality, mm. but have everything to do with my moral or unethical presumption. Yeah. So again, I, I, I'm going to be flawed with understanding the truth if the I do truth. that. Yeah. yeah. And then the fourth one that we've discussed so far was knowing through truth through personal experience and experimentation. And as we've mentioned, that's going to be problematic if we're not first ethical and moral. Exactly. So you can see all the way through, uh, you know, the question was, how do we know God's truth about anything? You can see part of it is ourselves becoming ethical and moral. Mm needs to be stated, doesn't it? We need to become ethical and moral ourselves before we can really know God's truth about anything. Because if we're not going to ethically, ethically and morally examine issues, then unfortunately we're going to be predisposed, predisposed to lie. Yes. And, and therefore predisposed to perpetrating it and accepting it. And rejecting truth. And rejecting truth. So really, you're almost saying that a cornerstone of like the capacity or the ability to know God's truth about anything is to have 
a desire to be ethical and moral in yes. all situations. Yes. And or, is it correct to say that without that desire, we cannot know God's truth? Not really. No, it, we, we may find bits and pieces of it mm -hmm. and we may be able to, and, and in particular, we usually find the physical parts of it, you know, yep. things like the stove that's a light burning us and things like that, and gravity pulling us to the ground, things like that. But when it comes to being truly ethical, when it comes to analysing the potential of us having thousands of causes that we do not know because they're invisible to us, we often skip over all of that. Yeah. And, that, and that would, that's a disaster for the human race because mm -hmm. if you look at our lifestyle, even now physically, there are many things that we live our life by now that are all invisible. Yeah. So, so we must make the presumption that maybe there are many, many, many more things that are invisible that are affecting our lives yeah. that we might be able to measure if we were aware of them. Mm -hmm. right? But by denying awareness, which is an unethical state, yeah. to, deny that we're, to deny that we're not fully aware is an unethical state. You know, it's like saying, I know everything, and we don't, and yeah. we, we should know that we don't. Yeah. And, and, but by saying that to ourselves, we preclude ourselves from receiving more knowledgeable or truthful information. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to our fifth uh, area or yeah. fifth, fifth way of knowing God's truth about anything, yeah. which is to know truth through the transmission of feelings. Yes. Now, this is a very important thing. Again, requiring ethics and morality, though, mm -hmm. but, but it's a very important thing. If you think about all the other methods that we've discussed thus far, every method requires a great deal of time, personal experience, potentially personal harm yeah. and, and, and hurt. And, uh, and all of them are difficult to engage and particularly difficult to engage if we're not ethical and moral about the analysis. Mm -hmm. If we were capable, assuming we're capable, if we're capable of receiving God's emotion or feelings, about a matter, mm -hmm. then it would make a lot of sense that all we need to do is feel that feeling and we would know. Now, this is not such a stupid idea because, as it might initially sound, yeah. you know what I mean? Because if we analyse uh, general communication today between people, we can see, and, and, and you know, psychologists agree, that over 90% of the communication that occurs on the planet today is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. In other words, people looking at your face and its expressions and looking, you know, feeling the energy, <laughs> the emotion that's yeah. coming from you, seeing the emotion and what it means and, and making decisions on that emotion. That's how a lot of communication actually occurs. Now, if that kind of communication we are able to engage in as humans, if we're able to do this as humans, then surely God would have a superset, a higher ability, if yeah. you like, to be able to do that as well, mm -hmm. to transmit feelings. We're capable of transmitting and receiving feelings from each other. And in fact, 90% of our communication on the planet today is about the transmission of feeling. And the main reason why it's 90% of our communication is you can't trust what a person says generally <laughs> unless their feelings agree yeah. with what they're saying. And, and you can see oftentimes the disagreement or the agreement mm -hmm. and what, what the person is saying. So, for example, so they're saying, I'm not angry, I'm not angry. <laughs> you know they're lying <laughs> right? because in their face you can see oh, they're angry, right? <laughs> so you know they're angry. And them saying they're not angry means nothing to you, right, in, the, in that moment. But can we differentiate there between observing and feeling? Because sometimes we observe people and because we're not feeling them, we think, no, they are angry. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to get not. to that because oh, that's, yeah. that's, right. that's the next step of it, isn't it? Not just observing the facial expression, but observing when they are masking their facial expression. Mm-hmm where the facial expression is like a smile on their face, when they're really inside. <laughs> their eyes are lying. <laughs> they are fuming. <laughs> yep. and, and if you're truly sensitive, you can actually feel that. Mm -hmm. And children are very good at this because yeah. children are the most, usually the most sensitive. So they're very good at feeling, wow, there's something feeling wrong there. You know, I can feel something wrong there. Now, oftentimes children, because they're connected to their parents, feel the first thing wrong with their parents. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's another subject. 
<laughs> but the, but uh, this feeling, this transmission of feeling is possible for us as humans. Mm -hmm. It's quite clear that 90% of our communication on the planet occurs through the transmission of feelings. Or is it observation or a combination? Well, it's a combination of observation yeah. and feelings, isn't okay. it? Feelings being observed by a person and then responding to those feelings. And could you also say that um, we are often communicating via feelings that are sort of codependent relationships in nature, which makes us not wish to really feel what's going on, but it is a feeling-based interaction, like yes, an attraction right. to a man who meets all of my emotional injuries. I'm not thinking that, oh, I'm feeling this from him, so now I really like him. But you actually are. But, it, but, but it is a feeling-based communication. It is, yes. yes. Okay. And so you're a very attraction, which you might go up and say, look, I'm really attracted to you. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's all driven by emotional feelings that you're, you're not truly aware of yeah. because you're choosing to ignore them. Yeah. And see, that's where it comes to ethics too. A person yes. who's truly ethical doesn't choose to ignore their emotions. Mm -hmm. But a person who's not ethical will choose to ignore their emotions. Mm -hmm. so, so when it comes to this state of feeling, when it comes to feeling truth, if we're capable of feeling each other and feeling truth from each other, then we're also capable of feeling truth from God. Mm -hmm. Quite, quite that, that makes sense. If God exists, then God must contain a superset, a more powerful set of potential expressions than we have, and therefore is co fully capable of understanding every one of our feelings and fully capable of transmitting every one of their, his feelings or the, her feelings to us. Mm -hmm. And now under those circumstances, you could see that we have a great, there's some great advantages if we can engage that. Yeah. And the greatest advantage obviously is that we don't have to go through a painful personal experience to know what the truth is. Yes. We can now ask God what the truth is and receive an answer based on the emotion, not the intellect or not words, but the emotional experience will tell us whether it's true or not. Mm. If we're sensitive, so there's the big if, if we are open and sensitive emotionally, and if we don't have our own emotional distortions mm. internally. Or desire to hold on to our emotional distortions, would you say? If I'm exactly. ethical and moral, I, I might have them, but I don't want to keep them. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But if I do have them, I must understand that they obviously will distort my impression of another person's emotion. Mm. So obviously that's not a great thing when it comes to receiving truth from God. So we receive a bit of feelings from God and it, because it's now going through my emotional filter, yes. I now assume that it's something other than what it was. Yeah. And that can easily be misinterpreted, obviously. Yeah. So unless I'm purely ethical and moral internally and also motivated to remove all of my own personal emotional distortions, the, this method of finding truth will have its issues. So that's the drawback. That's the drawbacks, but but it's not really a drawback. It's just a it's just a personal problem that we have yeah. with it. There's no real drawback because it's the fastest way of getting truth, mm -hmm. and and the fastest way of discovering truth. So so I suppose in order to relate this all to our question to hand, we've got five methods. So this is probably a summary now of those five methods. We've got the five methods that we've talked about, of, and, and they're not the only ones, obviously, there's others, that, but these are the primary ones that we've discussed, of determining God's truth about anything. And the best one is to actually feel what God feels about it. Yeah. And that's one way of determining truth. So when we talk about determining truth about forgiveness and repentance now, we can see that there are, we can do it through observation, we can do it through examination of the law, we can do it through personal experience. We can do it through hearsay, through some person who thinks they know, telling us even, or we can do it through feeling God's feelings. But in the end, we will find, and this is something I'd like to say through my personal experience, mm -hmm. in the end, we will find that there are laws associated with forgiveness and there are laws associated with repentance. And if you can understand them and engage them and understand the mechanisms of them, you have a grand way of understanding how to proceed when it comes to forgiveness and repentance. And we're about to move on to God's laws, but just finally, keeping in mind, as you said, this whole discussion is about God's tr truth about forgiveness, or this section of our discussion today, God's truth about forgiveness. And you've just 
summarise the five different ways that we've discussed about how to know God's truth about anything. If a person is wanting to know God's truth about forgiveness, obviously you and I are presenting here in these recordings truth about God's forgiveness. And as you've said, that's come through personal experience and would you say feeling God's feelings? Yeah, and actually not having gone through uh, the feeling of, of forgiving others and having gone through the feeling of being repentant for my own mistakes and having gone through the feelings of being forgiven by God mm. and being repentant towards God. These things are actual things that actually have occurred in my life and had, had instantaneous and long-term benefits to my whole life right from the first century till now. So, so to me, it's a very, very important subject that requires a deep degree of analysis by humans if we're ever going to solve humanity's problems, as we said in our introduction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anyone coming upon this material has those five options of ascertaining God's truth about forgiveness for themselves. Yes. It's through, through those five methods and hopefully through a synthesis of those five methods. Yes, or yeah. they can trust what we say. <laughs> <laughs> that would be relying on hearsay, wouldn't it? That would be. And, and this is what we're recommending against. They can trust what we say initially, but the best course of action is to engage the other processes of discovering truth so that you actually go through the whole thing mm -hmm. yourself. And then you will know that what we're saying about this particular subject is true yeah. and not just uh, you know figments of our imagination. Yeah. Mm.